this video i'm so excited i'm so excited for this video yeah you and your uncle will be shaking after this information mm? you and your uncle will be hey oh my god hey <laughs> many many africans like to say that homosexuality came from the west eh? it's a western thing but me i'm here to tell you it's not the case so strap up come on put on your seat belts and <laughs> get cozy because i'm about to show you i'm about to prove you wrong hey chosen family welcome back to another video today we are going to be talking about the ugandan king mwanga the second and the event in which he killed 45 christians we are going to be talking about how the king is remembered today and the topic of his sexuality let's get into it so first off some background information of kavaka mwanga the second ah uh, please i'm not ugandan so if i butcher if i butcher the names i'm sorry i'm sorry kabaka mwanga ii was the king to the bagandan people at the time he is also known to some as the bisexual king he is mostly remembered for an event in which he killed 45 christians during the years of 1885 to 1887. The tale goes that he engaged with sexual acts with men and the Christian missionaries did not like this. They saw it as sodomy, of course. And so they told the people within the court, the Christians within the court, not to engage in these acts. And so Mwanga didn't like this at all and executed these Christians for disobeying. When he came into power on the 18th of October 1884, his court was filled with a religious divide. The Protestants in the court were close to the British, the Anglicans were close to the French, and the Muslims were close to the Sultan of Zanzibar. And the traditionalists didn't like any three of those groups. Mwanga II already had the English, the French, and the Sultan of Zanzibar on his back to take his land, and therefore he had to take precautions in order to stop this from happening. One of these precautions was the event in which he executed the 45 Christians. Just so this makes a bit more a sense of why this event is so important, I want to give a quick lesson on one of the tactics that the British used for colonization. So, in order to make it easier for individuals to give up their land to the British, um, they would use specific tactics. One of these tactics was missionaries. The British would go to a country and they would convert individuals to Christianity and through Christianity this would make individuals more likely to give up their land willingly than with force because they would go against their king or overthrow their king. So this is one of the tactics that the British used in Uganda to take over their land. In Uganda today pilgrims celebrate Martyrs Day on the 3rd of June to commemorate the martyrs, the 45 Christians who were executed in Namungongo by Mwanga. However, there is some contradiction here because to celebrate this day, you must also look at why this event happened and the fact that the king had intimacies with men pre-colonialism. So I've searched up many articles which will be in the link below this one article by Rahul Rao looked at the portrayal and the remembrance of Kabaka, meaning king, um, Mwanga II, post-colonialism, and how exactly people remembered him today and their thoughts on the event that took place to commemorate Martyrs Day. So why exactly is this event so special? Well, the killings of Christians and other individuals is nothing new for the Bugandan kingdom. The king did this to stop individuals from breaking the law and to show authority and power. His father had actually done the same thing years ago and there is not a memory to celebrate those who had died. The situation was so polarised, the British wanted the land for themselves. In Rao's article, it said, the killings continued sporadically till March 1888 rousing a coalition of Muslims, Catholics and Protestants in opposition to Mwanga, who was deposed in September that year. So as you can see from looking at this specifically, there is nothing new for executions to happen when someone has defied a king. 
But as the British are looking to expand their empire and Mwanga is in the way, it is very easy to use the situation as a way to gain political power and agenda over a country. And it seems that this is maybe what the British did in this time. However, let's just go through a couple more things and talk more about Mwanga's sexuality. So it's very easy for us to look at Mwanga's engagements with men and put our own connotations on his sexuality. However, it is important that we do look at this topic from social context at the time and not modern time. Here's what we know. Mwanga had 16 wives and also engaged with same-sex acti activities with men. Henry Murdad suggests that the reason for this is so that the male subjects would not look or go anywhere near Mwanga's wives. And so to engage in these same-sex activities, it would stop them from looking at their wife, his wives. Um, this can also be seen through his court, as his court was separated in gender. Before we continue to look at social context, have you pressed the like button? If you haven't, press that like button now. Subscribe to my channel, press that notification bell so you get notified every single time I have a video. You done it? Have you done it? Okay, let's continue. Our next topic, <clears throat> gender and language. Very important things if we're going to look at the context of the time in which this event happened. So when looking at the language of Uganda society in the 19th century, we can see that princes and princesses were referred to as male and commoners were referred to as female, regardless of their biological characteristics. Princesses had the right to ask the hand in marriage of commoners and pay bride price. Therefore, in the context of same-sex intimacy and attraction, it may have not actually seen this way because of the language at the time used by the people. So for example, you have Mwanga engaging in acts with a commoner. Him being the king, he is a male. You have the commoner, who is referred to as a female, even if their biological characteristics are male. This, in the language used at the time, would not be seen as a same-sex relationship. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. So now we move on to the political shift through time. And I think this is so interesting. I'm just gonna have my laptop right here. <laughs> so Rao, the person where I got this into, um, article from, was interested in modern Uganda's perception of Kabaka Mwanga II and what actually happened on Martyrs Day. When he asked the Catholics and the Anglicans at the shrine what they believed happened, they said that the reason why these martyrs were executed was because of Mwanga's hatred and seeing Christianity as a rival, right? They made no mention of the king's intimacies with men, which is very interesting. And also, when we look at the people who were there at the time of the massacre, during 1885 to 1887, no one makes any reference at all to the king's intimacies with men. It is only until the early 1900s that these references are made. And all these references come from Westerners. This is very interesting because remember, the actual event happened in 1885 to 1887. So why is it now that only in the early 1900s, from about 1913, 1912, that they are now making reference to the intimacies Mwanga makes with men. The Catholics at the time of the massacre, as well as Baganda, make little reference to the king's intimacies with men. And this is so very interesting to me because it seems like all these ideologies of how Mwanga identified have come from the West. Therefore, it's so important to look at this from a cultural context at the time of the massacre and how that ties into sexual identity and so on. In modern Uganda, Mwanga is seen as the villain, but this wasn't always the case. During Uganda's independence in 1962, Mwanga was named an African patriot and the martyrs were deemed imperial collaborators. It was only until the assassination of the Anglican Archbishop Janani Lawum in 1977 that you see this shift from him being an African patriot to a villain, to a man who hated Christianity. 
And this is so interesting to me because as Rao points out, this shift happens due to political gains and changes. All of these things have in common is that there is a change, a political change, a religious change, and therefore the context and the narrative of this event changes, which I find so interesting.